So imagine a cube in some fluid, and the fluid is flowing in some arbitrary direction, and it flows, uh, let's say, in this case, generally from left to right, but it's also got some vertical components. Uh, it's hard to draw on the screen, but it's also got some uh, component of velocity into and out of the screen. The cube that we're imagining is a control volume, and we can imagine a control volume of, of any arbitrary shape, and more specifically, we can imagine a control volume that has any arbitrary volume and that includes a volume that is infinitesimally small and what I mean by that I can imagine a cube that's this big a cube that's this big a cube that's a little bit smaller and a cube that's as small as I could possibly imagine so let's think about this cube it's a tiny little cube in effectively an ocean of fluid and I'm gonna zoom in on it so that we know what we're dealing with we're gonna zoom way in on this thing so we've got our fluid here and the streamlines again uh, generally flowing in some arbitrary direction so here's our cube again to give you a sense of, of the scale that we're talking about. And let's de define a coordinate axis. We'll say uh, right-hand axis, x, y, and z, Cartesian coordinates. And we're going to put, let's put the axis, uh, the zero, the origin of that axis, right at that corner of the cube. And I'll put them back so that we can just see the, the direction of it. But I'm going to draw a red dot. And at the red dot, x, y, and z all equal zero. And the cube has three infinitesimal lengths associated with it. Here's dx, uh, dy and dz. All the continuity equation is is a statement of conservation of mass. So we could say that the mass flow into the cube minus the mass flow out of the cube is equal to the rate at which the mass within the cube changes with respect to time. So in other words, if mass flowed into the cube but no mass flowed out, then the mass within the cube would increase with, as a function of time. Or I could say if the mass flow leaving the cube uh, if mass leaves the cube more quickly than it flows in, then the amount of mass in the cube decreases with time. And to keep it simple, let's say that mass will flow in from the left side, we'll deal with that first, and out through the right side. So here's my x component of velocity. So let's look at the mass flow in on the left side of the cube. Just dealing with that, what it is is the density of a fluid times its volumetric flow rate would give the mass flow coming in in at that location. So let's say the density, the volume, let's say the density at some arbitrary position x times its velocity at some arbitrary position x times the cross-sectional area. In this case, the cross-sectional area would be uh, dy dz. So effectively what I'm looking at is the density times a volumetric flow rate and that gives me a mass flow rate coming in from this surface. And I'll also have fluid traveling upward in the positive y direction. So that's fluid crossing this face of the cube. And I'll also have fluid, there's also fluid flowing out of the screen or in the uh, positive z direction. And that's flowing from this back surface of the cube. So here's the second term dealing with mass flow in from the bottom. And the analogous term to account for fluid flowing in from the back face. And I can do something similar to account for the mass flowing out of the cube. So to keep it simple, let's deal with mass leaving the right side of the cube, mass leaving the top of the cube, plus the mass leaving the front side of this cube. So I've cleaned up those equations and I put them up in the corner to get them out of the way. Let's deal with the mass in the cube. The mass is simply the density of the fluid times some differential volume. So that'll equal the density of the fluid times dx dy dz. And if I take the derivative of the mass with respect to time, dm dt is equal to d rho dt times dx dy dz. So now if I get those out of the way, what I'm going to do is I'll make the substitution for m dot in, m dot out, and dm dt. So here's my mass entering minus my mass leaving is equal to the rate at which mass is accumulating within the control volume. So let's take this equation. We'll divide both sides by dx dy dz. So naturally on the right hand side, the, all three differential terms, differential lengths drop out. And we're left with one differential length for each of these remaining terms. So after canceling out terms and rearranging, I've got here's a rho times the x component of velocity evaluated at x. And I've subtracted off this term at x plus dx. And I did the same thing for the y and the z components. And because we're dealing with differential lengths, these are just equal to the partial derivatives of the density times the velocity uh, with their respective lengths. And because we're de dealing with differential length scales, the three on the left are just equal to the partial derivatives. And then finally, if I move terms around, I get the continuity equation. And finally, if I, uh, 
And finally, since we're dealing with differential lengths and the limit of dx, dy, and dz approaching zero, I come up with the three partial derivatives on the left. And if I simplify these, or if I move them, uh, move them over, I get the continuity equation in its, its traditional form. There are a couple of common simplifications that can be made to the continuity equation. The first is if the flow is steady, then the density won't change with respect to time, and I'm left with the sum of those three terms is equal to zero. Or if I said the uh, fluid, if it's incompressible, then the density is not a function of x, y, or z, and that comes out. And if it's incompressible, it means the density uh, doesn't, it can't change with respect to time. It's also steady. So pulling density out of that, what I'm left with is a simplified form of the continuity equation, du dx plus the partial v with respect to y plus the partial w with respect to z. And the sum of those three have got to equal zero. To think about this equation, let's assume that the flow is two-dimensional, so there's no flow in the z direction, and, and w is equal to zero. So what we're left with is the partial uh, of these first, the sum of these uh, first two terms have got to equal zero. And let's say that the fluid's it's incompressible, two-dimensional, and let's say that the velocity on the right side of the cube is bigger than the velocity, the x component of velocity entering on the left side. What that would say then is that if that was true, du dx would have to be greater than zero. The partial of u with respect to x would have to be bigger than zero. If that is bigger than zero, that means that uh, dv dy has got to be less than zero. So what this is saying is that if there's some uh, velocity or there's some fluid flowing into the cube from the bottom at some high rate, it means that fluid flowing upward leaving the cube from the top direction has got to be less than the fluid coming into it. In essence what it's saying is that some of the fluid entering the bottom of it has to leave uh, to the right of it to, um, and that's what's increasing the velocity leaving the right side of the cube. So continuity equation in essence just a statement uh, conservation of mass and for steady state the mass within that cube has got to be, has got to be constant.